but uh, this week we're looking at acne vulgaris. Uh, otherwise, in normal parlance, usually referred to as pimples. Uh, this is a very common disease that a couple of us see, especially on an outpatient basis. And even sometimes following complications regards the treatment, complications regards the writings not being done, the people end up uh, sometimes on in hospital ad admission. So we are glad this afternoon to have to share this uh, with you regards how to manage acne vulgaris, either the OPD uh, for the mild moderate ones and sometimes in regards. So join me in welcoming Dr. Vitus as he takes us through acne vulgaris. If you also uh, keep in issues, as you always know, when you join the meeting, you would be automatically muted. You will be unable to unmute yourself once the presentation starts. Kindly make use of the chat box, which is available all throughout the presentation for your comments, com suggestions, and questions. Then at the end of the presentation, which we hope to be in 30 minutes, we'll have some time uh, to discuss uh, these. And together, I'm sure at the end of this presentation, we'll be updated on how to manage acne vulgaris. So that much I do, Dr. Vitus, please take us off with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Yeah, well, uh, my name is Vitus Danere. I'll be present today. Our uh, topic is acne vulgaris. My moderator is um, Dr. Dominic Katiba, physician specialist at World Regional Hospital. So, this shall be the outline of our presentation. So we'll look at the definition of acne, we'll look at the epidemiology, we'll look at the etiology, the science. and symptoms, diagnosis, medical vaccination. Hello, Vitus. I just think uh, we have some problems with getting the feed from Vitus. Uh, sorry about that. I'll try to get in touch with him and see if he can rectify us, rectify that and then uh, continue with his presentation. Thank you.
Hello. Hi, Vitus. Hello. Yeah, so go ahead. You can start. Can you hear? Please go ahead. I think he's lost again. Sincere apologies for all these uh, technical challenges. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear The background is very noisy. So move away from it. Boss, I'm going to point this. That is, the network will be better. Can you hear me now? Is it better? Uh, can you hear me as well? Yeah, I can hear you both. Right. So what I'm saying is that the background in which you are is extremely noisy. So if you could move on. Is it better now? Yes. Yeah. Is it better now? Wow. There is a child speaking in the background and it's unbearable. Yeah, but when I was inside my room, when I was inside my room, I wasn't getting a network, so I had to move out and uh, no. Yeah, so we can I, wait I don't know. To to if you can bear with me, I will. Yeah, we'll, we'll wait for you so that then you can go to the there's no noise in the background, then you can start off. Wow. Okay. All right.
Hello, sorry, sorry. Please, can you hear me now? Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Hello, boss, can you hear me now? Please go ahead with the presentation. All right, Marcus, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Yes, please go ahead with the presentation. I can't hear you. All right, let him move for me. All right, so this will be the outline of our presentation. We'll look at the definition, epidemiology, etiology, pathophysiology, science, and symptoms, diagnosis. management and complications of acne. So, Acne vulgaris is a common chronic skin disease involving either blocking of the of both blockage and those units, which are the hair follicles and the accompanying vessel glands. Um, actually, acne can be presented as either inflammatory lesions, which include um, purples, nodules, spastules, or papulospastules or non-inflammatory lesions, which are also known as the commandos. So it could be either open commandos or closed commandos. So acne can actually be categorized or classified into mild, moderate, and severe. So, um, so mild or commandonal acne is simply the open or closed commandos. So that one is classically just the common news alone. We'll look at the meaning of the terms I'm looking at pretty shortly. And then the moderate is combination of common news plus few um, inflammatory lesions, such as the nodules, the purpose, nodulocystic lesions. And severe 
is the extensive number or quantity of the inflammatory lesions, including the extensity of how it's pressed and then the complications involved. So let's look at some of the terms we'll be using alongside as far as this presentation is uh, concerned. So a purple is simply a circumscribed elevated solid palpable skin lesion that is less than one centimeter in diameter. A nodule on the other side is the same um, description, but it has a diameter of more than one centimeter. A pustule is a circumscribed lesion containing pus. And then open comedones, which are also known as the blackheads, uh, results from a plaque follicle, which get exposed and oxidized, releasing the skin pigment, which is the melanin. So usually that is what um, commonly we call the black spots. Uh, but apparently those uh, spots are not dead. It's just the melanin that has been exposed. And then um, we have the closed comedones or white hairs. That one is just a completely blocked hair follicle um, that is hidden beneath. Um, also have a macule and a patch. Yes, uh, a macule is just a flat, distant, discolored area of the skin that is less than one centimeter in diameter, and but does not feel different from the rest of the skin. So it just uh, uh, describes the same description as the rest of the skin, just that it has a diameter of more than one centimeter. So, so these are the terms I'll be using most like uh, often in the presentation. So let's get acquainted with them. All right. So we'll look at the epidemiology of acne. Um, as the name suggests, it's very common, um, but in terms of occurrence, is commoner in the youth, affecting 85% of uh, such group of people, as against 5% of people uh, that is adults and uh, who are those who are above the age of 45. So, and in terms of age, it affects males of 14 to 19 years and females of 10 to 17 years. Usually, the adolescents. Yeah. And in sex, the first um, males more than females in the adolescent stage, and the vice versa in the adulthood. In terms of race, it's lower in Africans compared to the whites. And genetically, it is a multifactorial um, genetic issue. Notably, we have the Satochrome P450 gen family and other minor ones, and they contribute about fell white. So, etiology, as um, I indicated earlier, the main underlying cause of acne is genetic predisposition, which accounts for 50 to 90% of the cases. Uh, so um, the main genetic um, or gene involved with the cytochrome P450, and then three beta hydro, this steroid, the androgenase. So these are the two main genes involved, but we have other minor ones, but these are the two main ones. And um, though genetic uh, um, has, or play a major role. We also have other factors or blocks that interplay to cause acne. So um, we have other contributory factors such as medications. So medications, we can be talking about iodide, as a, uh, niazid, danazole, steroids, and lithium. We also have cosmetic agents, especially some of the uh, pomades we use. Um, we also have emotional stress, pregnancy, and then um, mechanical occlusion with head bands, shoulder parts. Um, so in such cases, people who wear uh, head bands or shoulder parts, they occlude their follicles. So there's no such um, that free excretion of the sebum. So they accumulate in the follicle, 
they come distended, and then that will lead to uh, acne. We also have other systemic uh, disorders such as, as the polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a, a, a syndrome of hirsutism, acne, oligomenorrhea, among others, and then the congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So sometimes acne is just, just, I mean, a block or part of the whole syndrome. So it doesn't stand alone. No. We have to take notice of that. All right. So the pathophysiology, it is a multifactorial issue or it has a multifactorial causes. But the key, as I keep repeating, is genetics. And then we also have some uh, other factors which come into play. So there's an interplay between inflammation, molecular hyperkeratinization, and then the action of the acne bacteria, which is the QT bacterium acne, and then SS uh, sebum production. So let's stay a little bit here. For, so for the pathophysiology, um, if you look at the follicular epidermal hyperproliferation, it results from changes in the um, normal keratinization pattern in the pilosebastos units with keratinous material becoming more dense or thicker, thereby blocking um, the secretion of sebum. Sebum is just a thick oily substance containing fat, keratin, and then cellular debris. So these keratin blocks are known as the comedones, or they represent the time bomb of uh, agni, vulgaris. So, and so we also have the, the activity of the QT bacterium agni. This is a, an anaerobic bacteria. It's the commensal usually present in agnes. This uh, bacteria contains the enzyme lipase. It converts uh, lipid to fatty acids and produce pro-inflammatory uh, mediators, such as interleukin-1 uh, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. So these fatty acids and pro-inflammatory mediators uh, create a sterile inflammatory response to the palocybaceous units. Uh, so you can see that where that that is what the picture is depicting. So if the sterile uh, inflammatory environment is created, with time they become distended, the follicles become distended, break, and then the contents, which is the sebum, lipid, fatty acids, keratin, and bacteria, will enter into the dermix and produce. Uh, an inflammatory foreign body reaction. Uh, so leading to the formation of the inflammatory lesions, which are the papus, nodules, and then the pastures. So uh, uh, this is a picturic uh, representation of what I'm trying to explain. All right. So the signs and symptoms of acne are what I've just displayed here. So. If you see an acne, you know it's an acne. There's nothing, uh, the diagnosis is clinical. We don't do anything to diagnose acne. So if you see it, you know it's acne. So these are some of the pictures of various uh, degrees or categories of acne. We have the mild, moderate, and severe. Yeah, so acne actually affects typically areas with densest population of um, sebaceous follicles. So we are talking about the face, neck, trunk, upper arms, and then the back. However, in extensive or severe cases, they can extend as far as areas of minor uh, uh, population of sebaceous follicles. So it has these local uh, symptoms of uh, erythema, they could be tenderness, and they could be what pain. So by systemic Presentation of acne is very rare, but uh, it does occur in, in cases of complications such as the acne onglobata. This is a highly nodulocystic acne um, that has interconnected abscesses. I will show you a picture getting to the end of the representation. And another um, serious one is the acne fulminus. This one is a highly spreading inflammatory lesions that is associated with fever, joint pains, and general malaise. So in these two um, complications of acne, you may have a systemic um, involvement or a systemic symptoms, but if not, it's usually very localized. 
So acne, as I said initially, it is the diagnosis is clinically is clinical. However, um, in cases of suspected polycystic ovarian syndrome, from, uh, you may have to investigate further. You may have to do full blood count, uh, luteinizing hormone profile, follicle stimulating hormone total, and then free testosterone and lipid panel to make sure that you are not dealing with this syndrome. Um, but it is just a, a, an isolated case of uh, acne. And then another scenario where you may have to investigate more is when you are doing a long-term antibiotic treatment for um, acne and there's no improvement. So in such case, or you, when there's improvement, you stop and it goes back. So in such cases, you may have to take culture to rule out a gram-negative folliculitis. So these are the two scenarios or um, uh, your clinical judgment where you may have to investigate better. If not, diagnosis of acne is clinical. You don't do anything to diagnose that. When you see it, it's uh, acne. All right. So the management of acne is a multidisciplinary issue. So we may involve the physicians, dietitians, clinical psychologists. And then the treatment is divided into pharmacological and non-pharmacological blocks. So um, the clinical presentation and the, and the patient preference strongly influence your selection of the mode of treatment. There are numerous treatments of acne vulgaris, uh, which include topical, oral, and procedural uh, therapies, uh, which will be seen pretty soon. So before you start, treating somebody with acne, you, you have to assess, we have what we call the pre-assessment uh, um, stage. You have to actually check to see what type of lesions you are dealing with. Are they just comedones or uh, they are inflammatory lesions? Because each of them will determine what kind of treatment you go in for. And then the severity of it, how is it distributed? How widely distributed are the lesions? And in the presence of complications, such as scarring or, and then psychological stress. We also have the um, potential contributory factors. Some of them, it just is what their lifestyle. So when you tackle the lifestyle, the patient becomes fine. For example is the medication the patient is taking and then the skincare uh, products. So uh, let's look at the pharmacological management of acne first. So as I said initially, we have the mild, moderate, and severe categories of uh, acne. So if you assess a patient with acne and you realize that the patient has just a mild or the comedonal acne, um, be before we say that, let me, let me make this point clear. The treatment of acne is actually a build-on approach. Usually we start with this. If it doesn't work, we add on the next um, uh, medication and then in that order. Hello, boys, I can't hear you. Hello. Hello, Betty, can you hear me? Hear me. Hello, Betty, can you hear me? Hello, boss, can you hear me? Ow. Right, I hear you, go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. So as I said, it, the management of, of acne vagari is an add-on approach. We usually start with a particular, uh, I mean, like when we assess and we realize that this is the stage of the um, acne, we'll start with um, the topical and then add on and add on and add on, which I'll be explaining here. So, uh, but that is what I just want to establish so that um, we'll have that at the back of our minds while I try to explain the management. 
So if you assess and uh, it is just uh, exclusively commendonal acne, that is it just either the black spot or the white uh, head. Uh, if they just that one alone, we use the topical retinoids, which includes uh, tretinoid, adapalin, and tazoratin. But if a patient is reactive to any of the topical retinoids, the alternatives we use are the salicylic acid and the azelaic acid. If you assess and the patient has mild inflammatory papulopustular acne or mild mixture of no, the patient has both comedonal and then few uh, inflammatory lesions, you may have to add on as I said. So the, you see put the patient on the topical retinoid, but then you may have to add on either benzoyl peroxide or topical clindamycin. Okay, but the take home message here is that if you're putting a patient on a topical antibiotic or systemic antibiotic, you have to add on benzoyl peroxide to reduce the risk of um, antibiotic resistance. But you can actually put the patient on benzoyl peroxide alone. But anytime you're putting a patient on topical antibiotics, such as the topical uh, clindamycin or the systemic ones, which we'll see later on, you may have to add the benzoyl peroxide to reduce the risk of uh, uh, antibiotic resistance. So, but in severe cases, um, Betty, can you go back? Good. Mm -hmm. We have moderate to severe acne management, which um, may not work with the topical retinoids or the topical antibiotics. So in such cases, we have the hormonal agents, such as the oral contraceptive pills for women only. Um, but before you start to uh, uh, put somebody on that, you may have to follow the WOH uh, well health organization recommendation for the uh, oral contraceptive pills because it's not everybody, every woman that is eligible for the oral contraceptive pills um, regimen. You can also start somebody on the oral spinolactone. Uh, maybe he, <laughs> to prevent questions, the issue why we are using uh, spinolactone here is that um, it is an aldosteron antagonist, which we all know. Uh, so it actually competes with testosterone for binding sites at the receptors in the sebaceous glands. So as it displaces more uh, testosterone from binding to the sebaceous glands, um, it reduces the risk of um, acne formation. I didn't actually speak about that, but the, the, that is the reason why um, females or males in the adolescent stage, we know at that stage we have more testosterone who develop uh, um, acne. So, but if you add, if you put somebody on the spinolactone, it will displace the testosterone from binding to the sebaceous glands, and then the acne formation will be reduced. You can also put some Body on oral um, antibiotics such as the tetracyclines. Examples are doxycycline, minocycline, saracycline, or the azithromycin or erythromycin group for pregnant women and children less than eight years, which will not be are not um, <clears throat> eligible for the tetracyclines. So you give them the azithromycin or erythromycin. So exception of the oral um oral as a tretinoid. So you use the tetracycline or oral contraceptive and spinolactone in conjunction with the topical therapy. As I said, it's continuous addition. So but with the as a tretinoid, that one you use it alone. That one it is like the last resort in the treatment of acne. Okay, but the rest you do the topical uh, retinoid you add on the topical antibiotics, and then you can go to the systemic ones, and then maybe it's and all that. But when you are putting somebody on that, so that one is alone. It is like the last resort when you are treating a, um, acne, and it's actually meant for specialists. It's not everybody that can put a patient on azotretinoid. All right. So, all patients before initiation of um, astrotrenoid should be 
to have the baseline for blood count, liver function test, serum cholesterol, and lipid profile. And they should be regularly be checked to establish any complication. The patient should also be educated on the potential risks and monitored for indication of inflammatory bowel disease and depressive moods. Actually, the drug, as I said, is for specialists and it has so much adverse effects that follow up with um, further or, or routine uh, checkup or baseline medic, uh, investigations so that you can pick up any uh, complication that may set in. So all patients that are on oral contraceptive pills or tetracyclines or spironolactone in conjunction with topical therapy should be reassessed every three months. If there's no improvement, you can now combine them or you switch, you stop all of them and switch the patient to the last resort, which is the retinoid alone. So that was for the pharmacological treatment. So the, the non-pharmacological treatment, we can actually uh, um, also change our lifestyle or I counsel the patient to avoid um, food such as skim milk. If the patient is smoking too, the patient has to stop and then manual extraction of comedones. But this one is done by professionals. It's not what we do by daily present. You can also um, advise the patient to take low glycemic diet and avoid uh, junk foods. Then there's also an option for the light and laser therapy. But well, I'm not sure whether that can be done in Ghana here. And then the counseling and education of patients, which is very important because treatment of acne is actually a long term thing. It takes about three to six months or even more. So you have to counsel the patient on the need to be compliant. They need to be a patient because uh, I mean, it doesn't just go overnight. And then the issue with depression, because some actually have inferior complex and then all that because of the appearance of the inflammatory lesions. So counseling is very, very, very important. If not, they may not comply with your medications or your treatment, because they may think that it's not working because of the slow response to the treatment. All right. So these are some few complications of acne vulgaris. So we have the acne conglobacter which I explained earlier on. So these are highly inflammatory nodulocystic lesions with interconnected abscesses. That is the upper left corner. Now the upper uh, left, you can see it. So the highly inflammatory nodulocystic lesions with interconnected abscesses. And then the acne fulminance is the upper right. So uh, there are fast spreading inflammatory lesions with systemic fever, joint pains, and general malaise actually very painful. And then we have the Agni illodalis nuca. You can see it around the back of the head there. And then we have the Agni form eruptions, permanent scarring, and then the psychological effects. So some tend to have low self-esteem, some are anxious, and then depressing setting. Some actually have suicidal I mean, tendencies because of their appearance. And then maybe be treating for some years or months and it's not uh, getting improvement. So these are um, some of the complications of uh, acne. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, so the floor is open if you may have any question. Thank you so much once again. I'm done. These are my references. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Vitus, for taking us through acne. Uh, so a uh, couple of things, just to once again apologize for this uh, uh, long delay. I think we've never done this before uh, since the apology, so we'll skip to our time. Uh, next, we'll try to get the presenter to prepare way ahead of time so that then we don't have to go past time. Thank you for sticking around despite the difficulty. Uh, so uh, we would shortly open the floor for questions and for comments, but like I indicated at the 
beginning of the presentation, the chat box is always uh, open, even till now it's still opened. You could go ahead and then uh, you make your uh, comments in there if you don't want to uh, probably raise up your hand so that then we allow you to uh, talk. Uh, in the chat box, like you see now, I've just put in uh, a link in there. Kindly click on it. You give us uh, a survey of how we deliver today's presentation, uh, what the learning points that we need to change going forward. It's just about four questions. Uh, we've listened to your contributions as well. And so this survey has been modified. Uh, so that then those who, a couple of people ask for the slides. So if you fill in this survey, the last question takes you to your email address, which uh, directly you provide that and then we send the slides over to you. So that's another advantage of completing the, the survey. Week on, week in, we would send the various presentations over to you. So kindly click on the link that I've just sent over and they provide your responses so that then uh, we will be able to improve upon subsequent presentations. I'm sure definitely there will be a lot of comments regarding the delays, which I've already apologized for. We will work hardly towards improving that. Uh, as well, you will get the slides if you are able to fill out the survey. At the end of it, you realize that there is a link that takes you to provide your email. Well, what we've done with this is that we want the survey to, go, to be completely anonymous. And so as a result of that, once uh, you click on the last one, it would ask you to provide your email. It has no link directly to the responses that you provide, but you need to complete the first three or four questions, which are direct head on and suggestions. So kindly make use of this. All right, so kindly check in the chat box. You have the link in there, click on it, and then we'll send you the slides. Uh, we have about 16 people on the call. Uh, if you have any question, just put up your hand. I will ask you to unmute and then you can go ahead with your question. So whilst we're waiting for people who have questions to put up their hands, uh, just a few things that we should take home uh, from the detailed presentation. Uh, one thing is that we should know acne is very common. Either it's affected you or it's affected your sibling or a friend that you would be aware of. A uh, very common uh, condition, especially in adolescents and young adults. If you have not been, your sister would have been or your friend would have been. And there are a lot of uh, misnomers regards acne and a couple of things that people do which are quite risky. Uh, one common thing you realize is that a lot of people would try to best open the, the closed comedians. We will strongly advise that you desist from doing that and advise patients accordingly, especially the, the, the lesions that are on the, head, the forehead and on the face, because you may just cause an intracranial problem. You may disseminate an infection and you can track in the problems. So we strongly advise that people don't do this. Another disadvantage of doing that is that when you do, like most people who will tell you, that part of it undergoes what we call secondary hyperinflammatory hyper hyperpigmentation. And so you realize that when you then see the right person or even put you on good treatment, the lesions get cleared off. And then that post inflammatory hyperpigmentation stays for a long duration of time, which definitely on the face, especially for the young females who would want to have the face intact, it becomes a bit of a challenge. Another thing for prescribers as well is to take note that acne is not treated with triple action cream. Dermatologists will always seriously advise against using triple action cream. I don't know how it's found this uh, locus in our district hospitals. So people come with anything dermatological we prescribe triple action cream. It is a sad thing to do. Why? Because it's just saying that the, the doctor does not know what he's doing. Triple action just means that I don't know what you have. I'm giving you everything and anything, i.e. giving you steroids, because steroids are in that triple action cream. I'm giving you an antibiotic, 
I don't know if it's an infection. So we just take an antibiotic. And then I'm actually adding an antifungal agent because I don't know if it's a fungus. I'm sure if you are a patient like that, you will not be happy with what is done to you because definitely I can come to the hospital and treat me for anything and everything. Just like coming with a fever, I treat you for malaria, I treat you for enteric fever, I treat you for type, uh, what do you call it, pneumonia, I treat you, I just say, I don't know. I even treat you for cryptococcus. So let's desist from that as well. The next common thing that a lot of people talk about is the role of diet. You realize a couple of people come in to uh, say that uh, when I, uh, the doctor has asked me to stop taking granite or to stop taking uh, some milk or any of that. In actual fact, the two things that have been noted to be contributory to acne is usually milk and high glycemic index diets. But these are things that have been proposed. Yeah, there are still prospective trials that are necessary to clarify whether there's a direct relationship. But so typically what we say is that if you take a particular food that you know that it worsens your acne, then you may have to uh, look at avoiding or reducing that. Uh, the common sequelae, like he did mention, definitely the post-inflammatory fragmentation scarring is one of the things that follow acne. And typically it's as a result of uh, either scratching, bursting open the closed comedone or any of that, which we strongly advise against. Again, he made emphasis that the diagnosis is purely clinical. So it just rests upon the patient's history and the physical examination, picking up the various points that he uh, brought out. So lab tests are not necessary for most patients who have acne, it's only a few of them who uh, typically you may be looking out for uh, hyperandrogenism and even with that, the clinical features will push out to that. And so when it's that way, then you may have to test for androgen excess. Uh, there are a couple of differential diagnoses, which I think he, he did mention, but the thing is that let's rely more on the clinical history uh, to make the diagnosis of acne because there isn't lab tests that you do and that I will tell you that you have uh, acne. And so these are things that we should be aware of. And of course, the treatment, like you put it in detail, you, the options are usually to start off with the topical agents, there's even the oral agents. There are even interventions that you can do uh, regards the, the, the acne, uh, which are new uh, things that are coming up. So uh, some of these is actually good that we get to know about them. And of course, he's categorized it into uh, whether it's exclusively comedonal acne, what you have to give, whether it's just a mild acne, what you give, a moderate to severe acne that you, what you have to give, and at what point you may need to let a specialist have a look at this person. So these are the bases that we should get to know. And then going forward, we would be able to treat our patients better. A kind of reminder that the, Survey is on the in the chat box. Just click on it and then provide your email address for the 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 slides to be sent to you. I don't see any hand up. We we'll just allow a minute to see if any hand will come up. Otherwise, then we can close for the day. Anyone who has any question, just put up your hand electronically and then you could ask. All right, so in the absence of any questions, we want to thank you greatly for joining us for today. We've gone way beyond the time today. Usually we try to do it in 30 minutes, but it's, I guess it's worth it today that you'll be able to join us. Thank you and God bless. Please take care, bye-bye.